What are your intentions with it? Well, um, I, I don't, I'm not going to say at this point, education community, pop the champagne cork because the Senate has the bill now and we can fix it. Two weeks, three weeks were wasted. The whole point of that thing was an early funding bill. The ability to early fund is now in question based on the fact that they didn't fund it. So we'll do what we can. We're going to look at that. We're going to examine it up and down. We're going to listen to the school district uh, superintendents, particularly the ones that were in town now, and I think there were a few uh, last week. And um, we'll, we'll figure this out. But uh, they shouldn't think that it's, uh, been, it's fixed just because we have it in our hands. Senator, can I jump Go ahead. just mm -hmm. for a second? Um, you know, this is going to prove that the two bodies are required to make something happen, right? Um, the, the path to avoiding uh, pink slips is uh, maybe paved with good intentions, but it requires funding. We can, we can say really nice things about education all we want to. The Senate's going to work to avoid that situation that we ran into in, in the past. Um, we do support education. We're going to work to make sure that we don't have that same situation. We lost a lot of talent last year by waiting um, so long to pass that budget, but it takes both sides, and it's the perfect example. The House can't wave things around and uh, talk about um, their plans. They have to execute it with funding, and we're going to work with them to make sure that that funding occurs. Press conferences don't create their own reality. You've got to fund this thing. And I, I don't want you to think that the Senate doesn't have a desire to early fund education, because we do. We're just very disappointed that in a discussion about early funding, that uh, three weeks were completely wasted in the House. Next. We have Nat on. Oh, hey, Nat. Got a question? Yeah. Uh, good, mo good morning, guys. It's Nat from uh, Anchorage. Morning. Um, I, I was wondering if um, each of the three of you could speak uh, to your personal opinion on uh, whether K-12 schools uh, should get some degree of BSA increase, given that they've essentially, from my understanding, have been flat. Nat, Nat, can I stop you? Uh, some of your operative words uh, we didn't quite get. If you just start that sentence over again. Yeah, I was. I was asking. Um, I was wondering if each of the three of you could speak to whether you think the uh, K twelve schools should be uh, getting a BSA increase uh, this year, given that it seems like they've been held flat for the past few years. Sure, go ahead, uh, Senator Machiki. Yeah, thank you, Nat. That's a good question. Uh, you know, when, when, if you remember that chart that showed all the cuts of every department um, <clears throat> as we made our cuts from, uh, you know, 26% of the operating budget, essentially none of them other than within the department were associated with education. In fact, we still gave an increase to the BSA. I am not supporting an increase to the BSA this year. We've explained that to education. Education doesn't expect an increase to the BSA this year. They're willing to adjust with the effects of inflation with the flat funding that we talked about in the past. So I, I think their desire is to avoid late funding that impacts them. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know of any educators that are in this building looking for an increase. That would be an unrealistic approach at this point. One of the things that we are looking at is one of the largest cost drivers in education, which is health care uh, for public employees. And so uh, myself and a few other legislators and business members and stakeholders are on uh, the health care transformation project. And so we are looking at that now in conjunction with SB 74 that was passed a few years ago and looking for ways to decrease the overall cost of health care for public employees. Nat, my comment was going to be made on health care as well. Besides the BSA, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not looking for a cut necessarily. Uh, an increase is probably not a discussion that we're going to get too deep into. Um, but the fact is, is that we can give them some tremendous relief if we can figure out a health care answer. So, got it. Thanks. You, get, you good? Okay. Steve? Oh, wait a minute. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew was trudging through the snow to get here. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Hi, Andrew. Uh, Angela Rodell um, has suggested that a 4.5% draw would be sustainable, more sustainable than the, uh, the draw that's currently in SB 26. And the House majority sounds like, basically says that they agree with that. So what are your thoughts on lowering the uh, amount in a sustainable draw? So uh, we just had a presentation by Angela Rodell um, the other morning here. Uh, 
So remember her report that talked about a failure rate. You guys all jumped on that, but it didn't seem like anyone understood it. The failure rate that she talked about was a $1 or more reduction in value. That was the level they talked about for a failure rate. It was not an overall failure of the POMP system. I frankly, frankly think that's light. And for those that are hoping for a larger gap that support revenue in the form of taxes, they're going to lean in that direction. We will have um, the Permanent Fund, Dividend Corp, and Ms. Rodell before us again in Senate Finance to specifically talk about that. When I asked her about our POMV, she said, well, no one came out and said, do you support that draw level? Give me an opportunity to do that. And I think you'll see that in Senate Finance coming up. Five, five and a quarter percent that drops to 5% in three years is well within the acceptable limit of draw for any type of endowment account such as that. Many on the planet are based on that level. Uh, the reality of it is it's far below the expected earnings. And again, don't let the last week's market <coughs> concern you on the draw. This is a five-year <coughs> trailing average, which already brings that draw down in the 4.5% range when you average out over the last five years. Uh, we've got people that got to get to finance, so we're going to take one more question, Steve. And then uh, has anyone who hasn't asked a question, do you have one? Go ahead, Steve. Um, question is, what do you tell the people of District E right now, and can you give them a sense that they will get representation before the year's out, before session's over? Clearly, the, rep the people of District E are going to get representation. Uh, we are going to look at their choices for their senator. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to consider Mr. Kowalki. There's, there's a lot of things at play here. But we're very concerned that the choices that they make going into the future are given consideration. We hope they reach us so that we can either say yay or nay to the people of, uh, of that district at that time. We'll Mr. probably support them. Mr. President, Go ahead. we have to remember that that seat belongs to the people right. of District D. It does not belong to the governor. It does not belong to us. Right. We want them to feel that they were fairly heard. And at this point, nothing against Mr. Kowalki because I don't know him. We believe that they deserve to be heard with that they went through a uh, process. They gathered the folks from both districts, and, and I struggle with the choice that was made at this point. So we hope they have an opportunity to be heard. Let's call it. See you guys.